Testing. Oh, yeah. Good morning. Here we are. Oh, this lighting is kind of somber. I went with blue because the cover of the book that I read is blue, but it, and with my ring light, it kind of makes it look purple. Hey, don't mind me. Don't mind me, viewers. I just, uh, I'm icing my shoulder. I still got, I still am dealing with that tendonitis, but it's not going to, it's not going to hold me back. It's, I went to the gym and lifted again for the first time today in a week. I took all week yesterday, and I I did yoga and lower body exercises and running. Played some pickleball, but I didn't do anything with my left shoulder. And, geez, it's taken a while. It's, like, it's getting better, like, barely each day. You know, I... It's like I'm just trying to think of other injuries where it's basically you, you forget when you wake up and you forget that you were even injured. I mean, this is just little and little, little by little, uh, barely any improvement, but improvement. I was able to do some snatches with the kettlebells and uh, I, but I spent like 30 minutes warming up my shoulders, warming, warming up which is probably something I should do every time anyway, but whatever. So I'm just going to ice it, and I'm not, you know, I don't care. I got this frozen water bottle right here. I'm going to just rub on my shoulder 
because I'm, I'm, it feels good, and I'm sure it needs it. I'm also going to go put some Icy Hot on after this. I didn't want to put it on before because I didn't want to die while <laughs> we were doing the podcast. Icy Hot's crazy. I had tendonitis in my foot a year ago, and I... I just ignored it. I completely ignored it. And I tried running and it basically debilitated me for an entire day. It was the it was the craziest pain besides breaking my fucking shoulder, but it was the craziest pain. And then I p- rubbed some icy hot on it before I went to bed one night and I woke up all the way gone. 100% gone. It and it, it's never bothered me since. It was the craziest thing ever. So prop maybe it wasn't tendonitis, but I tend it was it was just excruciating and I ignored it and it got worse and worse. And then that one was I had ordered a I was doing a big job in Lehigh. Hey, this is the podcast, by the way. Good morning. I was doing a big job in Lehigh and I walk all day long cleaning carpets and I was cleaning storage units, so I was just walking all day and I was running and it was getting worse, and the job, it was like a two-week job, and it came on like the day one. Anyway, I ordered a cast, a boot cast for that foot so I could do the job, but then I put some Icy Hot on it, and it was gone. It's crazy. So I'm going to try, I, I haven't done any Icy Hot on my shoulder. I'm going to try it out. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, that's how we're gonna, we're starting. That's how we're gonna start this one with uh, tendonitis. It could be a tear too, a tear in my shoulder. I I've, I've been doing a lot of Google research on tendonitis, rotator cuff, and there's four tendons in there that keep your arm attached to your shoulder. And uh, yeah, but usually if one gets inflamed, they all get inflamed, and it's a crazy sensation when I lift my arm up. Like this? Yep, right there. I can feel it like something. It feels like something is getting rolled over. And you, it like gets tight as I go up, and then it just rolls over. It's weird. It's a weird sensation. But if I'm pressing on the front of my shoulder, you know, if, if I'm pressing right here, ow, if I'm pressing in with my hand, I'll do it with a water bottle. And I, then I try to go up. I don't, it, does, I don't, it doesn't do the rollover thing. Bodies are freaking weird. It's really weird. I don't want to make it worse, but I don't want to stop exercising. I don't want to stop lifting. I don't want to lose any of these. I don't want to lose these gains. And that's uh, that's famous last words. I went light, though. I'm trying to do more functional strength training. I want to do more functional strength training instead of this traditional strength training. I isolated, isolating muscles and stuff. I like the Spartan. I want to be like a really good Spartan racer, I think. I want to be very functionally strong and manhandle the Spartan courses. I was going to try to do a a uh, the Beast before the end of the year and get my trifecta, but I don't want to fly to Florida in December. Yeah, who cares? All right, let's move on. So, good morning. This is the this is Caden's podcast book club, and we do this live every Monday on at nine. Nope, we do it at eight a.m. Mountain Standard Time, and we stream it live on Twitch and on YouTube and on Facebook and on Streamlabs OBS and on uh, Buzzsprout. Nope, I don't think Bubs. I think Buzzsprout just hosts the podcast host the when i upload it so we, we do it live and i have chats going for anyone who wants to show up and i don't advertise the podcast so i don't get a lot of viewers and i don't get a lot of a lot of action it's mostly just friends and family probably and that's fine by me so right now uh right now it's eight fifteen, and if you don't catch it live well, then i post it on spotify and apple podcasts and all of that you can listen to and post it on YouTube or it's uploaded on YouTube from the live so that you can watch it later if you want but nothing crazy is happening it's just me rubbing my shoulder with an icy pack 
and trying to talk. So uh, this last week I read Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet by oh, his name is hard for me to pronounce. Teek Not Han. T I T H I C H N H A T H A N H. They call him Ty in the book for short, so I'll call him Ty. This book was uh this book was let me see. Okay, here we go. Here's a little bit about Ty. The book was uh, authored by Ty, and there was, uh, I don't know what the word is, but um, the his students helped write the book and have some of their own sections. So there's three authors that of mention. Ty, Sister Chan Kong, and Sister True Dedication. Tai is a world-renowned Buddhist Zen master, poet, author, scholar, and activist for social change who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Dr. He was nominated. I don't know if he won it. By Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's the author of many best-selling books. Through his books and retreats at the monasteries, he has founded in the U.S., Europe, Asia, and Australia. Did I read that right? Through his books and retreats at the monasteries he has founded in the U.S., Europe, Asia, and Australia, he has become a preeminent figure in contemporary Buddhism, offering teachings that are both deeply rooted in ancient wisdom and accessible to all. Uh, he's, he's old as hell. I think he's like 95 right now. He uh, he uh, tells lots of stories, and I think, I think what got him into the... Uh, into the discipline as a monk as a into the zen the world of zen was the vietnam war in the 60s so he's old he's been around sister chan kong is thai's most senior monastic disciple and lifelong collaborator a leading force in his engaged buddhism programs and humanitarian projects her books include learning true love and beginning anew and then Sister True Dedication is a former journalist and monastic Dharma teacher ordained by Thai. She, uh, uh, Sister True Dedication is half of the narrator on the audiobook. She, I, f I found the book through TED Talk. TED Talk had shared Sister True Dedication's post about the book. The book just barely came out. Let me see. This year, it was, you know, I believe it was just barely. Yeah, 2021 from Plum, in, by Plum, Billi Plum Village Community of Engaged Buddhism. Yeah. It's awesome. Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet. Ty has other books called Peace is Every Step and The Art of Living. Those are the two that they uh, made n mention. But he's a world-renowned Zen master in Buddhism and all of this. So we're going to talk about Tai and how he thinks we could save the planet, why it needs saving. But first, I need coffee. I kind of like the blue light with my ring light coming out to give this purple. Because look, when I do just purple light, See if I can find it. Yeah, it's very purple. But blue? Blue's like a deep purple. Good morning, mashed potatoes. That's okay. Find your seat. We're beginning with Zen and the art of li uh, Zen and the art of saving the planet. You can talk to your boss after class. Dude, how dumb is Zoom classes? That's like exactly what it is. It looks like you're in a beautiful sunset. Okay, so I nailed it with the color. I have a blue. I don't know if you heard me. I was, I've got a blue light with this ring light. It makes a really 
deep purplish look. Plus, I got my white hat, my white dad hat, and um, John Mayer's current mood. Remember when he did current mood on Instagram like five years ago? I bought a t-shirt, or I bought this hoodie from him. I'll support John. Zen, uh, uh, Zoom classes, jeez. Uh, Kayla does Zoom classes with nursing school still. They're just going to, uh, she's going to finish her program doing Zoom classes. And does anybody actually learn anything in a Zoom class? I guess unless you're fortunate enough to have a really dedicated space to, to Zoom and you can have your notes out like you're taking notes like actual class and have a dial. I don't know. I've never done a Zoom class but it seems like most most people are probably not doing anything there's times where you know kayla's scheduled 24-hour shifts and she has this class and she can't so she just turns on the zoom mutes her camera or whatever and then just sleeps (laughs) i would do the same thing anyway this is this is my zoom class book club okay Okay, all right. All right, okay. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about... I'm pulling up my notes. Zoom classes are lit. Way more convenient than in person. Well, I'm sure that... Yeah, I bet they're way more convenient. But are they as effective? Like, do you enjoy your Zoom classes? Do you feel like you're getting as much out of them? I guess that's all that really matters. But the convenience <coughs> thing is huge. I would s- probably still opt for Zoom classes. But as a 20-year-old who doesn't ca- didn't care about school, if I was at Utah State and they had mandated Zoom classes instead of on-campus classes, I probably would have dropped out way earlier. I barely went to class. Or I, did, I went to every class, but I barely paid attention in class. And it would have sucked. I think I'm more mature now to handle it. To handle Zoom classes. Okay, books, Zen. Introduction. <coughs> yes, the theme of oneness is prominent throughout the entire book in this one. Just like in the Yoga Sutras. I mean, it's the same, it's the same discipline, Buddhism, oneness. So the, the principle of saving the planet is saving ourselves. We are one with the planet. We're one with each other and with everything on the on the earth. Um, this uh, and the concept is he painted a really cool picture how and how it makes sense and it makes sense to me. He says all life is compiled of matter from the earth. Everything is. Everything comes from the earth. Uh, they say in science that matter cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed. It can only be changed. And that's that's all that bo- human bodies are. That's all any life is. It's just change it, from what's already available. We're all made of the same stuff. And uh, so, in essence, we are the planet, and the planet is us. And if uh, the the way that we're like we're like the you know, our bodies have cells that run around and operate in our bo- operate our body. We're like doing that for the earth, I feel like. We're like the little cells. The earth makes us and then we just we we do everything to you know, we think about agriculture, compost, how animals eat each other and then they shit on the ground and then all of that turns into compost. Over time, it becomes valuable resources for new life that just that cycle continues to happen the earth made us to do to make the earth more beautiful however now we're we're become we've become too uh too capable to do stupid things that are destroying the good qualities of the earth that's that's pretty much what the book this book is all about we become too smart for our own good his generation has borrowed. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ty's generation has borrowed too much from the planet and is passing the earth on to the younger generation, 
to younger generations in bad condition. It is the younger generation's responsibility to repair the mistakes. The whole world needs to wake up if we're going to save the planet. Yeah, it's a collective effort. And this is, uh, this, this is you know, this talked about capitalism, the boom of the, the booms with capitalism. And uh, sorry, I'm a little I'm, I'm thinking about taking this out of the. Anyway. So, uh, yeah, we've talked I've talked about how cap capitalism has exploited the good nature of the planet. Oh, that feels much better. And uh, because humans are humans want to consume. So people just make things so everyone can consume and we make. And that's how that's how business is done. And Ty says that his generation has taken too much from the planet to make too much. And it's and now that the older generation is dying and moving on. And we're filling there. We're filling the places of the powerful people. We, as in the younger generation, we have to repair the damage is done. It's our responsibility, but everyone has to be on board. So this book, this book's broken into three parts, and there were no chapters. There's not like chapter three and chapter six. There's no chapters. It's just these three parts. So. I'm going to I'm going to kind of wing it. Part 1 is a radical in part 1, radical insight, a new way of seeing. Part 2 is the action dimension, a new way of living. And part 3, communities of resistance, a new way of being together. So there's a way of seeing, there's a way of doing, and there's a way of being together. These are these are the three parts of the book that Ty proposes. Part one, a new way of seeing. Ah, the way we think is the most powerful tool we have for change. To wake up means to change the way we see things. We need to change our identity. Wake up to the beauty of the earth, he says, that you have a body and it comes from the earth and from the stars. Wake up to the suffering of the world. That the earth and its living species are in danger. Peace, awakening, and enlightenment always being with you. That's cool. Um, he says 250 million years. Okay, I like, I like this point because I've tried to make this point before. 250 million years ago, global warming killed 95% of life on earth. Was that the dinosaur era? New uh, and then new life formed a hundred million, hundred million years later. His point being, the Earth has, the Earth has undergone dramatic change that has made it inhabit in, uninhabitable for life. And I've said this. This is this is a, this is a. I had you know every I learned every aha moment I have or every idea I have is not original. Somebody else has thought of it first. And somebody else is talking about it in a book. So I'm just connecting the dots. I had this idea that, sure, we're going to destroy the planet with climate change and with our environmental destruction. We're going to destroy the planet and therefore make it uninhabitable for humans. And that's just, that's, it's, we mi remember the 12th hour? I wonder where we're at. I should check up on that. From like six months ago when we were doing this, um, where we're going to bring, irreversible damage to the planet if we don't make s dramatic climate change dis decisions or whatever well we're it's past october it's past the 12th hour so we're we've just we're if if that's all holding up we're destroying the planet the point is the earth has made the earth has been uninhabitable at points before and life has been wiped out Not, he says 95 percent of life was killed off 250 million years ago by global warming. And it took 100 million years later for life, for new life to develop. And that might just be that might just be the the next the next cycle of life. Humans are will probably all die off along with most large mammal species and the earth will go uninhabited and it will be like a cleansing period for the earth. All of the bullshit that we're doing will stop and the all of the natural cycles that happen in 
in the ecosystem will override the shit and make the earth beautiful and inhabitable again. And uh, that's the that's the whole principle of evolution. Uh, the uh, humans lived as some, or there was some kind of mammal species that existed while I remember reading about this while the dinosaurs were alive. But we weren't humans like we are now. We were, we were we were devolved uh, human species, and we were much smaller. We were something else. We weren't Homo sapiens. And there was no we. There were just this. There was another mammal species but they survived the mass extinction and took millions of years to evolve into whatever to whatever line of species that developed that became a homo sapiens all i'm saying most i had this idea and ty confirmed it that the earth un- does undergo change it's inevitable and we're basically expediting global warming with the with the way that we live and if you think it's just global warming, it's not. There, uh, another book that I can't remember off the top of my head talked about how the Earth undergoes global cooling uh, every was it ten thousand years and or a hundred thousand years or something, like ice ages. There's ice ages every hundred thousand years or something. It's, uh, the Earth is always undergoing changes. That's that's the that's just that's just been the 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 cycle, whatever. Okay, let's move on. Ah, the Diamond Sutras. These are uh, these are notions that a meditator is supposed to throw away. There's four. There are four perspectives everybody should throw away. The perspective of self, of human beings, of living beings, and lifespan. And this is central Buddhism as well. There is no self, there are no human beings, there are no living beings, and there is no lifespan. There are there is just living, there is just life. There, there is no self, we are all one together with the cosmos. Just like we said earlier, we came from the earth, we are the earth. Um, we come from the stars, we are the stars. We're made of the same stuff. It's a fact. We're all made of the same stuff. There is no individual, there is the collective, because we're all, this is Buddhism. Human beings, human beings, there are no human, okay, yeah. The notion of human beings. Human beings are no more special than any other living thing. Humans are made of non-living things of the earth and of our ancestors. Taking care of ourselves is taking care of the planet and vice versa. We must stop polluting the world as, as we much stop, I must have meant must. We must stop polluting the world and we must stop polluting ourselves. That's an interesting perspective. We are made of the same... We're made of our ancestors. We're made of a bunch of dead... Other dead things. Like I... Just like I was saying about how animals shit and die. And then their their waste and their corpse... Corpses... Corpi... Become compost to breed new life. And then it's the whole fucking life cycle... You get shit, and then, and then it turns into compost. It dries and turns into compost, and then plants grow out of the shit, and then animals come and eat the plants, and then we go and eat the animals. Or then the animal never gets eaten, and it dies, and then it melts into the ground over a long time, and then becomes compost for new life. It's a cycle, and then we, be, we come from the same stuff. So that happened with our dead ancestors. We're them. Human beings are no more special than any other living being, living thing. There are no living beings. You are made of non-living elements. Therefore, all things are alive or nothing is alive. Consciousness, this is a thought I had. Consciousness is only, are, is only chemical reactions. Whoa, it's a big burp. Uh, going down the same rabbit hole. Everything that lives is made of things that are not alive. And I've thought a lot about this, about how cells, like, if, so how am I able to move and talk like this anyway? You go down, you go down to the smallest living, moving, uh, independent, independently acting thing. It's a cell, right? And there's the things inside of a cell. And how cells move, I don't know. 
but somebody must have an explanation of how cells are able to interact with their environment and consume dead things to produce energy and to do other things. And then eventually they become multicellular organisms and expand and grow and become all of the living things ever. It's, that's a All life comes from cells and cells come from dead particles in the universe. I don't know. see that I'm not, not I'm just telling you I'm just relaying the info I don't know all the answers mm. oh that's good that's gonna spill though okay and the fourth one there's no lifespan here's a quote it is impossible to go from somebody to nobody there's only continued manifestations in different forms and I think it goes up the same tree. Uh, I'm barking up the same tree again. There's, is that the right expression? Nobody can die because nobody's alive. And all life is one with the universe and with the earth. And as long as the earth is alive and changing, then everything is alive. So there's no lifespan. There's just uh, changing and changes in life. There's no life or death. There's only transformation. Yep. Okay, the fate, and then here's just some more thoughts that I had from this this part. The fate of the world depends on karma. Karma, the word karma translates to action. You are responsible for your body and your environment. You are you are your environment as much as you are your body. Suffering and fear are unavoidable. Buddhists use the five remembrances to face fear. Ooh, I love these. Five points to meditate on. I am of the nature to grow old. I am of the nature to have ill health. I am of the nature to die. All that is dear to me and everyone I love is of the nature to change. I inherit the results of my actions of body, speech, and mind. I'll say them again. I am of the nature to grow old. I am of the nature to to have ill health. I am of the nature to die. All that is near all that is dear to me and everyone I love is of the nature to change. I inherit the results of my actions of body, speech, and mind. Beautiful. Five points to meditate on. These are called the five remembrances. Ah, all right. Beyond our basic needs for food, shelter, and a partner to love, we need understanding, love, and deep peace. We get them through meditation. Meditate to find the cause of your suffering. <clears throat> Do not deny your suffering. Embrace it to be liberated. A quote I took says, Make good use of suffering in order to create happiness. I, feel like I spent a lot of time reading and learning about or at least trying to learn about suffering. Because, as I've also said before, all life is suffering. That's all. To live is to suffer. So to live well is to suffer well. Right? When shit hits the fan, that's all. That's out of your control. All you're in control of. Oh, I, had, I had talked about this with my mom. I, I loved this. When shit hits the fan... All we are in, all we can control is our response, our response physically and our response mentally. But we are not in control of our response emotionally, because, like I said earlier, emotions are reactions to our environment. Our emotions are just our chemical reactions to external stimuli. Just like that's what that's what I think that's what consciousness is as well. Consciousness is chemical reactions to, or, or chemical reactions in our brain, whatever. But emotions especially. So when shit hits the fan and s someone you love dies, you lose your job, your house burns down in a fire, whatever it may be. Great, great deals, great things to suffer about. Uh, uh, Ty had to deal with his entire country being persecuted 
by America in the Vietnam War. His entire country. That's they have caused a great deal of suffering. So uh, his response is control what uh, consider what's in your control and forget the rest and to meditate on those five points of remembrances to face suffering and to face fear. Embrace your suffering to be liberated. Awesome. Meditating means living in your breath to consciously allow feelings in, let them stay, watch them evolve, and see them go. If you do not embrace your suffering, you will not know what it is. They talk a ton about meditating and deep breathing. Walking meditation and deep breathing. That's pretty much, I think that's everything that they do. I think they sleep, shit, m- walking, meditate, and uh, what was the other one? Oh, I just said it. And deep breathing. That's like the whole book, except they don't talk about sleeping and shitting. They just talk about walking, meditating. And, and walking, meditating, I guess, is really just being in your thoughts and walking mindfully. The book is very simple. The book is very simple, and it's all centered around Buddhist, tr- Buddhist ideology, meditating, deep breathing, and uh, uh, practicing nonviolence. Anyway, okay, yeah. So that's uh, this is this is again this is all part one, a new way of seeing, a new way to see the world and ourselves and each other. Ah, that's it. That's the end of part one. If you do not embrace your suffering, you will not know what it is. How easy is it, though, in today's world to disregard our suffering, to cover it up with whatever entertainment that we have with TV or with video games or social media? It's so easy to to just pretend like our life is not hard or that or that shitty things are not happening. Forget every mashed potatoes. Forget everything except fine dining. Fine dining and breathing. That's a good episode. We threw out his name. That's a great episode. That's really it, though. Uh, if you, uh, I think uh, this this particular line of Buddhism with focusing on Zen. Is, has a lot to do with the, is especially the breathing and the meditating, the walking meditation, and everything is done in mindfulness. All of your action and your and your thoughts are done mindfully. So when you're suffering, it's easy to, like me. I mean, I'm not. I I have a lot of problems. I do a lot of things wrong, and I mindfully scroll on TikTok still. And I'm and I've recently made some goals to limit or remove my mindless TikTok scrolling. But what is so fucked up to me is how accessible distracting stimulus is. And that's all TikTok is. I love that I've how I've changed my behavior on Instagram with unfollowing everybody that I know and kind of know and only following people that are motivating like Ty and like Rogan and Cam Haynes and TED Talks, the TED Talks page and and uh, uh, like The Rock, people that are motivating. So when I'm on Instagram, I get really inspiring shit. But TikTok, you can't I well, I guess I I know how to do that. I go and follow all those same people and only scroll on the following page. But the but the for you page where all of the random shit is all of the popular stuff that's circulating is that's where all the action is and you can't control it you can't get rid of that that's always there you can't you can't just see what you're following you see everything that's why tiktok is hard but this is why this, i think this is why it's so popular is it's a never ending stream of shit <laughs> you you just start it's 
you turn it on and it's right in your face and all you got to do is go like this to get content after content video after video and it's so easy to get to start drowning in it so easy to drown in it so even yesterday i i had just deleted the app entirely to refocus on my uh tiktok usage and i was driving around with kayla and we uh we were uh, going to her her parents and i we were doing something that where i was just i was feeling bored and it my instinct was to pull out my phone and scroll tiktok and i was like nope i don't have it i'm not gonna download it so i just i put my phone back down and i thought this is so this is such an un it's an uneasy feeling to be bored but to be mindful of that is what buddhism and what zen is to be mind to be aware of you and your and your identity and your how you're feeling that's that's what's important and i think it's people are like don't be bored and here just start scrolling or don't be bored binge watch this show on netflix and don't be bored play video copious amounts of video games but i don't think i think being bored in fact now that i'm saying it i think the uh, do nothing by celeste headley talks about how boredom being bored stimulates creativity it simulates your own creativity. So when you feel those feelings of boredom, oh, and I thought too, when we got to her parents, uh, we were sitting around in her kitchen and the TV was on. And I was thinking, what What about 100 years ago when there was no TV and people would visit their loved ones? There was no TV and there was no Spotify. You had to sit around and look at each other and talk or you removed yourself and you, but there was no distractions. You see where I'm getting at? There was no distractions, but now it's now we but we crave stimulus. Humans crave the stimulus. We all do. Nobody wants to be bored, but we get bored. And it's part I think it's part of our biology to be bored because it stimulates creativity. But now we use our board of our boredom uh, in the wrong way and we just look for things to fill our boredom and to or to distract us from it. But boredom stimulates creativity. And creativity is how we got all of the shit in the first place. Right? Bored is, being bored is how we got really amazing technology and really convenient things, ways to do things and all of it. It came from being bored or from, or from suffering or from having shit. <laughs> I mean, what 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 about the what about the slums in in uh, the UK? I I don't know. I have this memory of learning in in elementary or something about how uh, uh, when all of the apartment houses the really they didn't have toilets or plumbing, they would shit in buckets and they would throw it out the window and it would be in the streets. Right? Is that a true story? And it was from the suffering of everyone getting sick and dying that plumbing was invented right is that a true story because before there was before people lived in cities they lived scattered in small communities and they could shit in the forest and or in the desert or wherever they were and not have to worry about and there were only like a dozen of them they didn't have to worry about mass amounts of feces piling up am i talking out of my ass i'm always talking out of my ass i'm 45 minutes in and I'm, i've just barely finished part one and i don't even want to stop but we got two chapters or two parts. So I'm going to get through it. This is what attracts me to Buddhism and to Zen so much is the <laughs> dude, when your comments come through, they distract me, but I want them because you make funny comments. Mashed potato says, oh, so you're a plumbing historian now. I know I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a plumbing historian. That's a funny comment. But I'm, what I'm trying to say what I'm trying to say is Buddhism and Zen and most religions and w whatever, what attracts me so much to Buddhism and to Stoicism is, is embracing suffering. It's embracing hardship and boredom and, and these things that we try to mask all of the time because they're not pleasant. 
But just because it's not pleasant doesn't mean it's not good for us. It's not good. It, that doesn't mean it's not good for you. I think about being a kid and on Sundays, Nickelodeon didn't run. Cartoon Network didn't run. It was there. It was like Nick at night and it was whatever the adult swim would play on Sundays all day. And I hated it because I was we come home from church and it, there was like three hours before dinner or something. And I would be so bored. I remember walking around my basement being so bored and walking around outside. We had a big that green p- power box in our yard and I would play on the box, and draw on it and, on it and shit. But and, and I would go knock on anyway. Being bored stimulates creativity and kids want to be distracted. Everybody wants to be distracted because nobody wants to be bored. No one wants to suffer and no one wants to be bored. But that does not mean that they're not excellent teachers. Boredom and suffering are probably the greatest teachers of all. It stimulates creativity and it teaches us who we are in internally. Anyway, I'm gonna. I could keep going on and on, but that's you know that's the point. I, that's why Buddhism is to me is so attractive, and Stoicism, and I love that they're they say the same things, but they're saying it in different ways. Stoicism comes came. I don't know. I only know Marcus Aurelius really, and he was a Roman. And Buddhism comes from India, but these guys, 500 years ago, they lived in dog shit. Everybody everybody lived in suffering. Everyone was always suffering. There was never enough food. Nobody could get laid. And there was famines. I just said that there was no food. It was just shitty all the time. There was no there was not there was no technology to stay occupied. Everyone just got drunk probably and did drugs and killed each other. They fucked and they fought. <laughs> there was nothing else to life. Or you could you could focus on your boredom and and your suffering and make use of it. To live well is to to suffer well. Okay, that's part one, baby. Woo, we're on fire. Part two, a new way of living. Okay, now that we have a new way of seeing how to view the world and how we've destroyed it, or we are actively destroying it, here's what we do next. Here's what we're supposed to do. Okay, generate happiness and handle suffering with the th- the triple trainings of the mind. Mindfulness, concentration, and insight. Mindfulness is a path and not a tool. It is not a means to an end. Mindfulness, concentration, and insight. These are the triple trainings of the mind. You have to be at peace. You have to be peace before you can do peace. You have to be at peace before you can give peace Ty is an advocate for nonviolence. you have the right to pursue economic growth but not at the expense of life what have i been saying what did i say last was it last week about amazon exploiting their employees for profit and that's just what pretty much every company is doing they it's, you, growth and and opportunity is ex is good and we we need it we need to continue to expand as a civilization as individuals it's how we got to where it's how humans got to where we are now but we cannot continue to pursue growth at the expense of other life hey what's this seba seba seg S E B A S A G 1996. Want to become famous? Buy followers. Hey, uh uh-uh. uh. Nope. Fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, can I block these guys? That's dumb. Anyway, get bots in the chat. Mash Potatoes has been acting like a real bot lately, too. I got to be honest. Our enemy is not each other, it is hatred and discrimination. The root of suffering and violence is intolerance, dogmatism, and attachment to views. The root of suffering and violence is intolerance, dogmatism, and attachment to views. 
When you are nonviolent, exercise mindfulness and remain calm in troubling circumstances, you will inspire those things for those around you. Those who incite violence are a victim of fear. Uh, I had a thought. I'm going to wait till later in the book because we talk about it later. Money isn't happiness. Happiness has to be. Happiness is to be loved and understood. <laughs> Only the present moment is real. Anything you experience must be happening in the present. Uh, I made a note that says he mentions every person. Oh, yeah. Several, several times throughout the book. Inside each person is a meditator, a warrior, and an artist. These are constant themes that they don't really expand on. Um, but I made a note. In every person, there is a meditator, a warrior, and an artist. Freedom comes from not having everything we want, but from craving very little. That's a common theme that we've talked about several times before. The most helpful thing anyone can do is to be a happy human being. So your career should be something you, sh you enjoy. It's not about what you do, but how you do it and how it makes you feel. Do not lose your life to your work. Lose your work to your life. Beautiful. I'm going to read that again because I really like that. The most helpful thing anyone can do is to be a happy human being. So your career should be something you enjoy. It's not about what you do, but how you do it and how it makes you feel. Do not lose your life to your work. Lose your work to your life. Make all decisions when you are free, not out of decision, not out of desire or fear. Right action is motivated by compassion. <sighs> these are hey, these are hot points, and I'm going to keep going. We are ruining our planet with our way of consuming. Our cons our. Uh, I think I meant to say consuming habits. Our consuming habits bring needless suffering. Practice mindful consumption. Eliminate suffering. Delayed gratification. What I t what was what was uh, a few weeks? Ago, I think it was probably from meditations. Met Marcus Aurelius meditations. This are the it's the exact same thing though. Mindful consumption. Uh, practice mindful consumption. Eliminate suffering. To to eliminate suffering. Uh, and then I emphasize delayed gratification. Mindless consumption is a common theme today, especially with how ava how easy it is to consume s for for most people. Most people are just a couple clicks away from buying almost anything they want and getting it delivered to their home in the same day. There's, I mean, how awesome is Amazon for having us providing a service like that where you can get pretty much anything that you want delivered to your home in the same ordering day in the same day as you, that you ordered with just a few clicks on your phone well how awesome are phones and i mean forget all that how awesome are phones just all the shit that we have that i, I, I that i'm able to make a cart full of all of this podcasting equipment and click a button and it's all delivered to my house. That's awesome. I don't want to talk about food yet because he talks about food later on. So we're going to just talk about our current uh, consumption. Oh, I guess. Okay. Okay. Keep that in mind. How awesome is all of that? Now think about um, our food. How easy it is to, conf to consume pretty much any food. Um, not eating, uh, he says, not eating meat is an effective way to decrease pollution and waste. If we stop consuming, they stop producing. He's an advocate for vegetarianism as well. And I say, is hunting not the most sustainable way to eat? I don't believe in factory farming, but I also don't agree with eating meat, with not eating meat entirely either. Um, okay, this is my point. All uh, our, all of the all of our novelty items, including our diets, are all of the food that's available and drink. Is 
so available. It's hyper available. It's hyper novelty. And most of it comes at a, at a cost. This is the point of the book. It comes at the exploitation of people and exploitation of the planet and its resources. And it's destroying lives and it's destroying the ecosystem. So we've got all of this. But at what cost? And I can't remember uh, where it comes from, but are we willing to pay a little bit more and wait a couple days longer to get the same stuff if it means that whoever is making it is getting paid fairly, getting treated fairly, or whatever? Are we willing to pay more for an iPhone if we know that no child labor was involved? Because there's child labor involved with every iPhone that's made. I don't remember the details. Something like the uh, it's either the lithium or some other material that every iPhone has. It's mined out of some country in Africa by children. And that's the only way to get the material at such a low cost. And those countries are willing to, to subject their kids to do it because the our their minimum wage is or our minimum wage is a good wage for them. What or whatever, however you'd say that. The price we pay for child labor in those countries is fair to those countries, which is also sick and twisted. But just because they say we're willing to exploit our children to mine something doesn't mean that we should do it because it comes at a really cheap cost. Just like we shouldn't have sweat, uh, sweatshops in China to make the, the make the iPhones. They make all the shit. You see what I'm saying? This is the point of the book. And then with factory farming, we get all of the food that we have. Fa- factory farming, cattle and pigs, sheep uh, for for clothes, and uh, giant monocrops like corn and wheat and barley and whatever. That's all unnatural. All of it is unnatural. But with the amount of people that we have, this is this is just how like because people were hungry. People have been hungry forever, forever. And then we learn how to domesticate animals and to domesticate crops so we can grow them con- in a controlled manner. And then over hundreds of years, this, that's called the agricultural revolution. And then over hundreds of years, we've developed a system where we can he- have massive crops and huge, huge, uh, huge, what would you call, st- like a pens of cows and chickens. But it were but like but then we deteriorate the quality of life for those animals and anyway it's this is but then and then there's huge consequences to living this way. But what's the alternative? So his al- he says, well, we can live off of a, a plant based diet. All of us can. But there's a reason that hunting is allowed and that hunting is necessary, and it's called conservation. And I don't know much about conservation but i remember listening to a talk from a guy in my public speaking class in college talk about conservation and how there's there's uh there's a you know there's a there's the food chain of prey and predator and humans are at the top and humans kill animals and eat them and remember when the white man came through and killed all the buffalo and we did it for sport that was overconsumption. Uh, but if we stopped killing all the animals, then they would produce, they would reproduce in mass numbers. Anyway, basically, the point is, we fucked the system up. There's a better way, there must be a better way to go about getting food. But we're hungry, and humans just want, don't want to suffer, and we don't want to be hungry. We don't want to be bored. So people are, pe- business people say, well, I know a way to get people food without and so they don't have to be hungry at a cheap cost and it comes with exploitation boom does all of it probably not but most of it probably yes remember seeing those guys with the masks standing around like the gateway and shit <laughs> what were they called they uh they like showed video they just stood there and played videos of the harsh conditions those factory farmed animals live in I mean, it's not like we d- don't know about it. We just ignore it. We just go to the supermarket and get f- the vegetables and fruit off of the shelves, the meat out of the f- 
freezer, the fr- the fridges, because we're hungry, and that's just where we go to get food. But to live sustainably is to is <sighs> to understand where it comes from, and consume in a way that doesn't damage the ecosystem. So, Ty proposes action on how to consume mindfully and why it's so important. And the less we consume, the less needs to be produced. Yeah, I got so many thoughts. I'm going off on all of it. He says, be mindful in your consumption. What you feed is what you nourish. The four nutrients everyone needs or that everyone consumes is edible foods, everything interpreted by our senses, volition, which means the power of one's free will or desire, and our consciousness. These are four things that we feed or that we need, nutrients that we need. Edible foods for our body, physical or uh, um, uh, sensational nourishment, like things that we can see or feel or touch or smell or um, we need to, we feed our desires, our cravings, and we feed our consciousness, our brains, our curiosity. So be mindful in all of your consumption. Whenever you feed your mouth, be mindful of what you put in. Whenever you feed your eyes, like social media, be mindful of what you're consuming in your ears, what you're listening to. Be mindful of what you're listening to. When you have cravings or uh, desire, free will, this is probably just action, things that you do. Be mindful in all of your action. Be mindful in every decision that you make. This comes, this, this means uh, how you use your body, how you exercise, or if you don't exercise at all. Yeah, this pro- this has, probably has to do with um, like service, how you perform service. Do you hurt other people with your body? Do you hurt yourself with your body? Um, be mindful in your volition and then be mindful in your consciousness. Be mindful of what you learn, what you study and what you practice and what you preach. Be mindful in it all. That's, that's, uh, a huge, that's, that's the theme of the book. Be mindful of it all. It's so easy to go to the supermarket and get groceries because it's just there. When you're hungry, the food is there. But nobody knows where the meat comes from. No one sees where the plants, the vegetables come from. No one sees where the Hershey bars comes from or where the the chicken and a biscuit crackers come from. We just it's just on the shelves. But if we knew what was in it, if we knew how it was made and how it got to the shelves, a lot of us I'm sure would be deterred. If if ev- with every package you bought, you had to watch a video of where this cow came from. It might change a lot of people's minds on if they were going to if they support how this animal was treated. I go shop at this local meat place called Don's Meat. I'm going to I'm going to plug in for Don's Meat because they sell um uh, they sell beef, pork, and chicken and maybe a couple other things. Uh at uh in these little shops from locally from local ranchers, local local what would you call them yeah ranchers uh, they raise these animals themselves and the idea is it's local it's sustainable and it's non it's cruelty free it's humane it's all humane this is the this is the idea instead of these massively produced places like mcdonald's has to get their meat from somewhere but not all not all mcdonald's or burger king or kfc is getting their meat from locally raised animals that don't aren't pumped with antibiotics that aren't abused i mean there's there's all of this shit there's all of there's all of it um and, and maybe they do i don't know I, all i know is all i know is what i'm learning and what i hear and if there's if there's any of that misconduct going on it needs to end if we're gonna if we're gonna try to continue to keep humans alive <laughs> keep the humans around and not destroy our planet, and consequently destroy ourselves. So uh, I always thought shopping local was dumb, but I think shopping local is probably the only way to live. And um, in uh, in Brett Weinstein and Heather Hang's book, 
twenty uh, first century uh, hunter gatherer's guide to the twenty first century, talking about um, moving resources from uh, is is a crime against the earth. Transferring resource a resource from one place to another, moving it from its natural habitat to an unnatural habitat is a crime against the resource. So this makes me think about how there's a season, there's a time and a season for all foods and all, you know, uh, so uh, an ethical and a resourcefully ethical thing to do is um, only sell in grocery stores what's available in your region at the time. But then that means a lot of people can't live in the boondocks because nothing grows in the boondocks or no animals live in the boondocks. But see, this is the problem, though. That's why all of this, sh- this that's why all this creativity and innovation happens. So people can explore and still have a Walmart. That's why we have semi trucks in the highways. Oh, mashed potatoes. Imagine explaining to 300 people years ago that we have giant supermarkets with unlimited food. And you can just go pick up whatever you want. It's actually a pretty crazy concept. Okay. Uh, That's that's exactly the point. We foraged and we fought and we've died just to get food. Not we, but our ancestors fought and died just to eat. Just to eat. And now people wake up. People wake up and they shit in the toilet. (laughs) And then they go to the grocery store or they don't even do that. They wake up and they shit in bed and someone comes and wipes their ass and then they and then they door dash and they don't even get out of bed and they have food delivered to their house. They have chicken and potatoes and salads and whatever. And they don't even leave their beds. That is uh, explaining that to someone 300 years ago is would be crazy. But that's the point. We got Hey, Moon. I don't know what y'all do, but I hunt my food every day. Yeah, I know you do. I know you do. Downtown Salt Lake is, is ripe. It's ripe with good uh, game for sure. For sure. I actually I actually want to get into hunting just for this. Just just to back up my, my newfound belief in sustainable resources. If I, you know, if I actually believe that to save the planet and to save ourselves – is to be a sustainable consumer. I have to be a sustainable consumer. I have to learn how to grow my own produce and hunt my own game. I just recently learned how to make cheese. It's just milk. It's just milk that's skimmed and then uh, cools off and f- and hardens into cheese. So I can I know how to make cheese. Hate says I watched Wally with Case this past weekend and it actually freaked me out. Feels like that's where we're headed, to f- for real. To too real for a Pixar movie. Vegan, Hey Moon, vegan, vegetarian is sustainable if you want to try it for that. Okay, I don't know if you were here a second ago, but I I don't think that all ve- like just being vegan or vegetarian is sustainable because of monocrops and monocrops are. And I don't know all of the details. I'm just I'm just going off of okay, I'm a I'm a dumbass. But listen, monocrops are not natural and they cause damage to the environment themselves. Having hundreds of acres of corn or hundreds of acres of wheat or whatever, not good. But if you want to grow, if you have your own garden where you grow tomatoes and cucumbers and, and you have apple trees and whatever, soybeans, whatever. To get all your food, that's sustainable, hundred percent. But I believe that humans eat meat. I believe that not everyone has to eat meat, but I believe that humans do eat meat. So a sustainable way to eat meat or to eat in general is to eat what's in your region, what naturally grows in your region in your area, and to hunt the natural game in your area. I don't know. I don't know. And how do you convince? I was I came home from Arizona last week and I was looking out the window of the plane as the as we were approaching the Salt Lake Airport. Thousands of houses, thousands of houses. I mean, how many people live in Salt Lake? Like five hundred thousand people. Three hundred. I don't know. I just pulled that number out of my ass. 
isn't there like 3.5 million people in all of Utah? There's at least six people. It's at least six houses. The biggest thing affecting the earth sustainability is big corporations, though. Hashtag down with big corp. 198,000 in Salt Lake. Thanks, Brax. Um, yeah, we, t we I was talking about I was I was talking about uh, mindless consumption. I don't know when you got here, but a hundred percent. Uh, the biggest thing affecting Earth sustainability is big corporations. We don't need all of the hyper novelty that we have, but we also do don't need all of the hyper uh, produce that we have, or the hyper f the hyper meat that we have. You know, we don't need the excess. We have everything in excess. Everything, food and iPhones and Amazon and Google, all of it. It's all in excess. But to convince to convince anybody that, hey, if you want to save your future generation, you need to stop ordering. You, you need to you need to only shop local. You need to grow your own food. You need to and to hunt your own food. And you just you know you need to lower your carbon footprint. Stop driving a car. <laughs> what do, what the fuck do you do? So we're just gonna keep going because I'm an hour and ten minutes in. I'm over my deadline, but this has been this is. Oh, you sent me a link. I'll click on it. Give me a second. Reese's reveals its largest peanut butter cup yet. <laughs> oh wow! It looks like a. It looks like it's as big as a pie, an actual pie. It's three and a half pounds. It's fifty uh, forty-five bucks. Three thousand pie. Only three thousand pies of this Reese's. Dude, that's just straight chocolate and peanut butter. And it's not even real peanut butter. Yeah. That's wild. And no, I don't think that's sustainable. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep going. Those comments are good, though. I'm glad you're here, Brax. It's been a while since you've been here. I appreciate it. Okay. Oh, well, maybe we're pretty much done. Because part three was very, very short. In fact, the whole book was part one and part two. And part three is pretty much a, like to wrap it all together. So part three is a new way of being together. Yeah, I got one of those one pound recesses that they sell out Christmas and ate the whole thing. <laughs> That was the beginning of the end for me, really. A one, you ate a one pound of Reese's. <laughs> Dude, that's a lot of Reese's. That's, I didn't even know that. I didn't know they made any of this. That's hilarious. Wow. A new way of being together. Six principles of togetherness. Okay, so first, a new way of seeing the world. Understanding that there is suffering in the world, that there's boredom in the world that there's hunger in the world. Understand that there's all of that, and we all experience those things to some level. Some experience it deeper and harder than others, but we all experience those things. It's good not to block them out. In fact, these things are the greatest teachers for us to learn and to move forward and to create a better world for ourselves and for those around us. So part one, to see a new world. Part two, what to do. Have mindful consumption in everything. Everything you do, be mindful. From when you wake up to when you go to sleep. Everything that you eat, everything that you drink, every step that you take to from where you're at now to where you go to work, all of the electricity you consume, the, per the things that you buy, the food that you eat, the food that you buy, all of it. All of it be mindful. And be as ethical as you can, I guess. Just And be as... Just be the best person that you can be in that regard. Make the best decisions you can. And it's hard. It's I guess the truth is it's a, it's probably impossible to be to live in Layton, Utah and have and be 100 percent sustainable. Or daybreak, but you guys in daybreak are crazy in Salt in Salt Lake. I mean, this, I just don't think it's possible to be 100% sustainable as the world stands right now. The best we can do is encourage everybody around us 
to practice sustainability and to practice mindful consumption on all fronts, right? Is that the best we can do? And then that's part two. Part three is a new way of being together. Hey, B. Moon, down with big corpse. Listen, I, I, I agree that there is a problem with big corporation. I agree that there's a, and I also think there's a problem with big government. I think big is an issue. But there are so many people, and nobody wants to let anybody die. So government comes out with programs to keep people from suffering. They give them, there's, there's welfare, food stamps, there's homeless shelters. No one wants other people to suffer. So a lot of, and then all big corporations are, like I said, is people fulfilling other people's cravings. So government keeps people from dying and corporations keep people from being bored, right? I mean, all, cons- all consuming this media and, and uh, consuming, consuming media, consuming fast food, it's all just people satisfying people's cravings. So it's their fault for exploiting the uh, uh, natural resources and exploiting workers to fulfill those cravings, but it's really also, it's mostly our own individual fault for caving in to our cravings. If we, if we had control of our cravings and our desires, if we could, like, I'll be completely honest. Yesterday, we went to yoga, and we were driving to, to Kayla's parents, and we uh, passed a Rancheritos and Kayla was starving. She had told me she was starving and I was like, well, let's just wait to s- let's wait until we can get somewhere to make some food. We passed the Rancheritos and I said, let's stop at the Rancheritos. We got a fucking burrito and it was delicious. And that was me caving in to my cravings. We need everybody to be able to say, I don't need to. I don't need Rancheritos. I am hungry and I don't need Rancheritos. I'm hungry and I'm going to eat I'm going to have to be mindful in my consumption. I mean, all of my food that I'm going to eat is going to be sustainable, come from a sustainable place. So it's corporations' fault for exploiting people and exploiting natural resources, but it's our fault for caving into our cravings. Mash Pajado says, I have an interesting window into farming. Wife's dad and all her relatives have been farmers for the living, and I have to say, they love the demand. Well, exactly. That's That's... It's good for business. Crave, that's why any business is, is in business is because of our craving. We cave into our craving. It's, a, it's, it's such a weird dichotomy. There's, we can't not have things. We have to have food. And we can't all – like that's, that's why trades became so important in human, human development. Uh, w- w- instead of everyone being independent – Tribes came together, cultures came together, and everyone specialized in things. There were hunters, there were gatherers, there were people that made tools, there were people that that made uh, clothes. Like there were, you know, the people specialized. I don't have to hunt, gather, make my own clothes, make my own house, blah blah blah. People people specialize in things, but the way to get people to do that thing, those things for me, is either I give them something in return, like a service, a product, or money. Something that we both consider valuable. That seems equal. That's fucking business. I, but we we so we have to have that exchange. That exchange is is the only reason why we have all the shit that we have. But we have to do it less, right? Just interesting to talk to the providers that actually work with the earth. Yeah. No, that's an that's an awesome perspective. It really is. My my grandpa, my grandpa's whole family line has, are ranchers, and I spent time in high school moving sprinkler pipe in big fields to grow alfalfa for cows. My grandpa raises like twenty heads of cow every year, butchers them and sells the meat. It's very sustainable. And when I talk to my grandpa, he makes he loses money on the business every year because it's not a business. He's made money doing other things and gets to do this because it's his it's his it satisfies his deep passions for living. 
his his uh, whole family has done it. He grew up doing it, being a rancher, and it's sustainable. But there's no money in it. There's no money in being sustainable, and it's really sad. But there is money in craving. There is money in desire. I mean, people desire sex like crazy. That's why things like Tinder and Bumble are so big because people want to get laid all the time. And then prostitution. Prostitution is the world's oldest trade. Selling your selling sex for money or for profit or gain. So we we have we need trade. We need and now that we have so many people to some level, we need corporation and we need government. But we don't need them in the capacity that they're in right now. Right now, the capacity that government and corporation are in is destroying the planet. And it's also our fault for craving what for craving these things. They're just providing for our cravings. That's why any business works. That's why car- I mean as a carpet cleaner, the only reason I'm in business is because people want their carpets cleaned. <laughs> if no one cared to, if no one had carpet or wanted their carpets cleaned, I wouldn't have I wouldn't be in business. Apple wouldn't be in business if nobody wanted smartphones if if nobody wanted a apple you know and then they made cell phones and technology super cool when you have multiple apple products they all talk together really well that's why apple's cool they're just filling the need and they're making it look really cool uh hey moon sustainable and vertical farming is a 90 billion dollar business i used to work with a sustainable farming client and they are planning on good they are planning on going public here soon. Sus- sustainable and vertical farming is not the business, though. You're just saying that's that's the um, like that's what sustain sustainable and vertical farming in the U.S. altogether is worth ninety billion dollars. Yeah, but what's unsustain what's unsustainable vertical farming? business like that's cool that's a cool fact I, all I know is all we can do is just be more That the whole point of the book is be mindful in all of our consumption these are the thoughts that I've had for uh, after reading the, these books and doing all of this shit we just all we the best we can do is to be mindful so part three I'm going to go through it really fast while you're typing if you have any more comments Six principles of being together, a new way of being together. We have physical presence, sharing material resources, sharing ethical principles, sharing insights and views, sharing from the heart, and compassionate communication. Uh, Three kinds of, I don't know what this point means, but I wrote three kinds of powers. I don't even want to share it. I don't know. I don't know what it means. So these are this is uh, as communities, in cultures, and now with the massive amount of people that are around, practicing physical presence, sharing material resources, sharing ethical principles, sharing insights and views, sharing from the heart, and compassionate communication is what's going to unite people together. I think that's why a lot of cultures exist, why religions exist. Is it's com- it's a place where people can share all of these all of these things and form this sense of togetherness of community. But to get the entire world on board, I mean, it, it, he's Ty is the most hopeful person on the planet, and we all should be if we want to save the planet, if we want to prevent irreversible damage from. Uh, global warming and all of that shit we all have to be on board but not everyone's all on board so it's easy to be pessimistic and say that there's nothing we could do but the best we could do is the best we can do hey be moon feed is the largest expense of any animal agricultural operation yet yet extremely exposed to the risks of changing climates oh wait feed is the largest expense of any animal agricultural operation yet extremely exposed to the risks of climate change, uh, changing climates, water shortages, price swings, and many other vulnerabilities. 
So vertical farming helps cut that down. Uh, explain to me what vertical farming is. It's, it's, that's not just growing crops. See, I'm so I'm so unaware of all of this crap. But uh, I have I did in this book he shared that uh, the majority of crops it goes towards feeding animals in the, these factory farms, and uh, so not only by consuming animals we have to produce more crops. We have to we have to produce more. Uh, this is kind of a side fact, but just sharing more about the future of farming. Yeah. Oh, and you shared the link. Thank you. I love your links, bro. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll wrap, th I'll wrap this up, but this is, this is the art of saving the, this is the art of saving the planet. Vanguard later. Of course, my guy, I've got you. We had fun last night, but, uh, and I got my shotgun up pretty pretty uh pretty leveled up the gun the game is far more fun in multiplayer when you have a uh, the broken shotgun but they'll probably patch that soon so whatever so this is the this is zen and the art of saving the planet by teak not han or teak not han i don't know his name i don't know how to say his name let's end with this a quote from uh, from Ty himself on the back of the book. When you wake up and you see that the earth is not just the environment, the earth is us, you touch the nature of interbeing. And at that moment, you can have real communication with the earth. We have to wake up together. And if we wake up together, then we have a chance. Our way of living, our life, and planning our future has led us into this situation. And now we need to look deeply to find a way out, not only as individuals, but as a collective, a species. Tik Nhat Hanh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for showing up this morning, you guys. Uh, your comments are awesome. Very much appreciated. For those of you who are listening to this later on, that's not on Monday when I do this live, you're, I would encourage you to come join us in the dialogue and uh, listen to or share your comments and your thoughts because I'm not a genius. I'm just reading all, I'm just learning. This is, I t I've told you from the beginning, this is my learning journey and, I, and the best way for me to learn is to share my thoughts. So I speak out into the void, but I love to hear, I love to be corrected when I, when I don't understand something or when I misspeak and uh, yeah, this is, this is a new, this is, this is, T this is Ty's part three, a new way of coming together. We share our thoughts, and we do it respectfully, and this is what we do. So come join me on Twitch, on YouTube, on Facebook Live, or all of those places. Mondays, 8 a.m., Mountain Standard Time, and or whatever, or text me, message me on the social medias. That's right down here. Okay, let's go have a great week. And uh, we'll have Thanksgiving the next week but we'll still be here for the podcast so uh plan on it and we'll talk to you next time have a good week everybody
Thank you.